If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Maura Murray, please contact the New Hampshire Cold Case Unit at 603-271-2663 or email them at coldcaseunit at dos.nh.gov or contact the family at www.moramurraymissing.org or contact them by email at moramurrayfamilydirect at gmail.com. Of course, links will be provided below. Hello, this is Rick, and this is Burn After Reading. Before I go on a long diatribe, I want to go over two standards in the true crime community as I see it, just so it sets the tone as to why I'm making this video. So you have true crime progressed people. These people develop the information in a positive way. They move forward where the evidence takes them. Minor speculation is acceptable as long as done responsibly, ethically, and morally. They form their knowledge steadily over time. Their view of true crime is comparable as to how one would study history. Then you got the true crime obsessed. They are influenced or controlled by a compulsive, powerful force such as strong emotion absent of substance. It's their reality TV, it's their entertainment, and they see true crime like a game. There's no empathy for the victims or their families. It's like the game Clue. You know, the Maura Murray community is a funny one. Not funny as in ha-ha, but funny nonetheless. You see, Lee, we, we live in this strange bubble where deductive reasoning isn't the gold standard, but wild and crazy conspiracy theories that not only reminds me of the movie Burn After Reading, which you've heard me talk about before, but it also reminds me of Mike Judge's highly underrated film called Idiocracy. I feel like I'm one of a few rational people stuck in an irrational community mosh pit. Just like in that movie where the idiots think we should water everything with a Gatorade-like type drink because it's what plants crave, so do the true crime obsessed as they water this paranoid and or intellectually dishonest idea that Bill Roush and his mother are hiring folks like Aaron, Jenny, and myself in some scheme to draw attention away from him being Bill. Depending on the mood of one particular person and the supporters of the theories, either Maura ran away to escape from her tyrannical boyfriend and family, you know, just ran away. And for what? And then, of course, there's the other one where... Uh, you know, Bill somehow pulled the wool over everyone's eyes and got away with making Mora disappear. He was so effective that he escaped the eyes of the family and law enforcement for over 17 years. But not the social media citizen detectives. No, 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 no. Nope. They were cunning. They were so cunning and they used those cunning tactics and their keen eye to figure it out while sitting on Twitter and Reddit all day long and accepting everything at face value from James Renner's blog. Recently, some have went back to the well and theorized that Mora was involved in a hit and run of someone named, and I believe the first name is Patrit, last name Vassie. Never mind, there's nothing to link her to the hit and run, and never mind that Vassy called it a far-fetched idea. But let's plan it in the minds of people anyway, and pull things from our backsides by irresponsibly claiming it could have happened while she was on the phone with Bill. Again, Bill always being the cause of these people's erratic speculation. Now, disclaimer. I understand the upcoming legal issue of Bill Roush, and I am not here to point to guilt or innocence regarding it, because I simply don't know. I will let the court decide how that turns out. However, I will scream to the rooftops that Bill was not involved in Morris' disappearance. The true crime obsessed desperately and pathetically try to link one with the other. 
They, the true crime obsessed, can be as creative with this as they want. But here's the th here's something I'm willing to bet. I bet if Bill is found innocent in his upcoming trial, these clowns will bring forth another conspiracy that the elites got him off because of his powerful connections. And there, there's just no justice. The system is rigged. It's like people who can't accept a win in sports games. When the results don't go the way they want it to, they'll blame the refs for handing it over to the other team. No matter what, Bill's the bad guy. The true crime obsessed, they need a villain. Last week, criminal, um, criminal profiler Pat Brown had a live stream about the disappearance of Maura Murray. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a nationally known criminal profiler, television commentator, author, and founder and CEO of the Pat Brown Criminal Profiling Agency and CEO slash co-developer of the Pat Brown Method of Investigative Criminal Profiling for Major Crimes Detectives. Pat has profiled cold cases for law enforcement for over 20 years. Her experiences in providing deductive profiling in homicide cases led her to develop the first criminal, criminal profiling and investigative analysis certificate program in the United States for Auxiliar College, which is a major provider of continuing education for military members and law enforcement. Pat joined forces with Police Chief Robert Lee to bring criminal profiling directly to the skill set of major crimes detectives, and together they have developed a specific method of investigative criminal profiling to be offered as necessary training for police detectives. Through the Pat Brown Criminal Profiling Agency, Pat provides criminal profiling consultation, education, and training to law enforcement, media, attorneys, universities, corporations, and private individuals. Pat specializes in crime scene analysis, behavioral profiling, threat analysis, psychopathy, serial rape and murder, victimology, terrorism, and homicide investigation. Pat holds a master's degree in criminal justice from Boston University. I've been following Pat Brown for many years. And I think she's one of the best criminal profilers out there. She tells you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. She doesn't try to shuck and jive to the media to get attention. In my opinion, she's the genuine article. Anyway, in her live stream, I thought she did an amazing job assessing not only the disappearance of Mora, but breaking down those in the true crime realm and debunking absurd theories, one of them being the tandem car theory. Speaking of, I had an incredibly mind-numbing conversation with people on Twitter the other day who try to hold that as a valid theory. They try to use the Brockton Enterprise article on February 20th, 2004 as evidence. The quotes they try to use for validation, police say they have considered the possibility that someone whom Maura Murray knew was traveling with her in another vehicle, but that remains unknown. So, no basis for evidence, just saying, hey, it's a possibility, and that was at that particular time. They figured since she was in a college town, maybe it was a possibility. Police have to look at everything, right? Also keep in mind at how reporters will ask questions. For example, if a reporter asks, is it possible she was traveling with someone? Law enforcement might say, yeah, sure, that's possible. But then look at how they conclude with it. They say it's unknown. Now, if they would have said, we have reason to believe she was traveling in tandem with someone, that holds weight. I'll listen to that. Since then, though, zero evidence suggests that she was driving in tandem with anyone. I mean, why drive in tandem anyway? Think about that. I mean, the theory was she was running away to Canada, right? I mean, I know... Sometimes there's a lot of these that really branch out. Um, it's like the multiverse of madness. But why why not just take one reliable car? I mean, why have Mora take her car if it was on its last legs? Why stage a scene that she was going to crash it in New Hampshire? Why not stage it elsewhere? You know, I don't know. Why, why take it that's going to lead north? 
Think about that. I'm running up to Canada. Let me crash my car going up north. <laughs> Who would suspect I might continue to go up north to Canada? Of course, the idea of it being staged is absurd. Um, the Westmans heard the crash. And, I mean, oh, sure. I know what the true crime obsessed are going to do now. They're going to say, yeah, well, Mrs. Westman say that she saw a guy in the vehicle with a, a red light that she believed came from a cigarette. Never mind, Mr. Westman disagreed. Uh, I mean, he did. He didn't see a guy. Um, I believe he did see a woman walking around her vehicle to the trunk. And, of course, let's not forget Butch Atwood. He only saw one woman, right? No guy. I mean, I guess if you really want to try really, really hard, you can always say that he was hiding under the car or he was hiding in the trunk. You might as well add alien abduction with it as well. And of course, um, one claim that really, really hurts my head is someone saying, well, we can't be certain that the person in the car was Mora. Beep, beep, beep! Oh, sorry! What's that? Oh, that's just a you can't make this shit up alarm! <sighs> you see, reasoning doesn't exist with the true crime obsessed. I mean, why take Pat Brown's expertise? What does she know? Nationally renowned criminal profiler and is damn good at assessing these things when you could just take James Renner, who uses conjecture to base his theories. I mean, let's take a look at one example. Uh, Renner strongly looked at a suspect in the Amy Mahalovic case and wrote about it in Scene Magazine in November 2008. A family member of Renner's suspect made a blog to combat that allegation. The family member did point out three key things in their blog. One, the suspect passed a polygraph test. Two, the suspect willingly provided DNA to law enforcement. Three, Suspect was never arrested. The family member has stated that Renner doesn't let facts get in the way of a good story. The family member points to reasons such as him being a writer and any exposure will help in selling his books. It's hard to argue that. I'm not trying to shit on Renner for being a writer and wanting to publish books and provide a good life for himself and his family. I met the guy... He was friendly, and we had a civil conversation, but come on, pointing at people and using conjecture for a story hurts other people. There are major consequences. And also, in an article uh, that I read in the Sandusky Register, police made this statement. While the Bay Village police appreciates James Renner's passion, his article does a disservice to the investigation. Now, to be fair, uh, Renner did eventually remove his blog post about this individual. I think he made several um, when he had the Amy Mahalovic blog. I don't even know if it's still up anymore, to be honest. Um, the family member's blog uh, also seems to be gone as well. Um, that or I just can't find it. Still, I think we can apply to what happened then to what is happening now. Last week... The family's official website released a blog entry, as did Renner on his account. Both address an email sent to Mr. Renner. The email was from someone claiming to be Maura Murray. Renner wrote it was most likely a troll, whereas the family said flat out that it was a troll. I happen to believe it was a troll as well. I don't believe it was Maura for one second, not even a percent. The family's blog also addressed some of the sick allegations about Fred by putting out statements from Maura's older sister Kathleen and her aunt Janice. As always, I'll link things below, but Kathleen mentioned the statements made by her ex-husband in Renner's book um, and how it shaped, you know, just shaped insin insinuations that were not true. And Janice stated that her words were twisted to make it sound like she implied something that she did not. And again, I'll link it so... I'm not going to go into it um, very much. You'll just you, read it yourself. You should read it from their words. Now, going back to the troll email sent to Renner, there's a current Reddit thread trying to stick it to a family advocate by saying the writing is similar to hers. It's so absurd that it doesn't deserve promoting directly. But you, the listener, you should know the kind of things that go on in their little true crime-obsessed world. They get off on this. These are the people who think they're helping 
when all they're doing is hurting good people and clouding the truth for fun and games. Meanwhile, on Twitter, you have some bastard trolling a slew of us, including Julie, with disgusting tweets. Just the other night, one of these true crime obsessed people drunk dialed me. I never gave her my number, so there's only one other person who did, and uh, that was someone I did not give permission to do so. To conclude, people on the true crime obsessed side of things falsely state my mission to end toxicity. I never said I was going to end it. I mean, I would like it to end, but let's be honest, I cannot control other people's behavior. However, what I can and what I will do, I'll shine a big white light on it, as big as I can. It's why I got involved, because it's not right to see good and innocent people get railed by a bunch of sick individuals who think this is a game. Maura Murray's disappearance isn't a game. Maura Murray is not a game. Crapping on the family is not a game. Messing with the family advocates is not a game. You would think we would have enough common sense to understand that, but unfortunately we don't. This is where we're at. It's time to stop being true crime obsessed. It's time you become true crime progressed. Learn facts. Don't make stupid insinuations that hurt people because there are consequences. Until next time.